Hello. Hey everyone, welcome back to Adhere in Apologetics. Super pumped you to join us today. I have Apologetics Squared. Are we doing a rebuttal to a rebuttal to a rebuttal? I think I got that right. Um, we're responding to James Fodor. Um, you released a response to our response on the fine tuning argument, and he had a video titled, Is Fine Tuning Actually a Good Argument for God? And Squared and I still think we do. So it's Mediocre Apologist, episode number two. So welcome, yeah. Squared. How's it going? Uh, going good. Thank you for having me on once again. I'm excited to do this. Yeah, so I'll just pull these slides up right now. And anything you want to say with regards to um, this now typed so professional text or anything before we dive right into this? Yeah, like uh, one, thank you, James, for the advice that we now like have typed text instead of handwritten. I think it does look a lot more professional now. And uh, also, he mentioned that like he doesn't know my name, so he's just calling me squared. I'm totally fine with that. I I, I like that. Uh, but if um, James, you want to call me something else. Um, I did actually have a nickname in college, uh, which was, what was it? Fedor, right? You could call me Fedor if you want. Um, in high school also, my nickname was Nathan Ormond. So you could call me that also, if like, if you want to clear up confusion. There we go. That, 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 there we go. You could call me, yeah. <laughs> it all makes sense. <laughs> yeah. It all makes sense now. I can go by James. That's fine too. Like, Zach's yeah. my first name, but you know, sometimes people call me James. So yeah, yeah you, you could call Zach James and call me Fedor. That, that way it will all be a lot simpler. And then did like James and Nathan go by like squared or something when they were in university? The jokes they put, maybe? just so you know, the jokes that I put in this presentation do get better. <laughs> okay, well we're off to a lame start, but anything yeah, else you want to say? Obviously, this is gonna be about the fine tuning argument and everything like that. Um, responding yeah. to James's criticisms of um, your original presentation. Anything else you want to say, maybe on that end, before we dive right into this? Uh, not besides that, I really appreciated uh, him doing a response, and I thought it was a pretty good response. So yeah, let's go in. Previously on Mediocre Apologists. Dun, dun, so, dun. Yeah. The original fine tuning argument uh, looks something like hey, look, theism predicts that we would have a fine tuned universe quite strongly, but naturalism, it, you need all these constants to get just the right values. So there's only a tiny speck of fine tuned universe in the naturalism probability space. Then we update in like a Bayesian kind of way on the fact that we live in a fine tuned universe so that theism dominates the. Uh, probability space. Now uh, James Fedora comes in with his lasers, laser eyes of logic uh, and blows it all up. What he says, um, and again, I'm just making a bunch of simplifications, is that it's unclear why God would make anything at all. And if God did make stuff, why it would be a fine-tuned universe. Like the orange represents other options that God had to do, like other things that God could have done besides making a fine-tuned universe, like making a bunch of angels or immaterial minds. Then he's going to turn his sights on the naturalism probability space and say, hold on, who knows what this probability space really looks like? Like, fine, um, the specific life that we have, like carbon-based life that looks kind of like us, yeah, that might be fine-tuned um, as far as we can tell. But the, the whole naturalism probability space, like all life, all forms of life, um, that's like very difficult. I, I thought he was saying like we just haven't researched that. Um, I, I Sorry, I misunderstood that. What he was actually saying is that we can't really even like delve into learning what that's like. We can't really um, figure out how, what proportion of red or green there really is. So then me and uh, Zach came and made a response video. Um, I argued that relationships are good and stuff. And so to have relationships, uh, God, sorry, because relationships are good and stuff, God would want to make relationships and uh, the fi a fine-tuned universe would act as a public forum for those relationships. So a fine-tuned universe would be expected on theism. And then for naturalism, I said basically that, hey, look, every green dot that the naturalist can point us to is surrounded by a sea of red. And if every green dot that they could point us to like is like that, then I'm going to think that the naturalism probability space looks like a sea of red with a little bit of green dots in it. Mm. So... I think that if you look at this probability space, I mean, theism still seems to get really boosted by the fine tuning argument. So Fedor came in once uh, again to respond to me and Zach's video. And he said, um, well, he looked at my premise that relationships are good and that's why God would make the fine tuned universe. And he had one question about this. And like he, the one question that he thinks I inadequately answered. And that question is, why would God create anything at all? And if he did create anything at all, why would it be relationships? And if it was relationships, why would they need a physical universe? And if it was a physical universe that they needed, why would it be a fine-tuned physical universe? So 
because he thinks that I inadequately answered this one question, he's not really convinced that the theism probability space has a lot of grain. He still thinks it looks somewhat thing like this. Now, for the naturalism probability space, he used the words good objection uh, to, to describe this um, point that every green dot is surrounded by red. So I, I'm quite happy about this. But he points out that um, the, there are other possibilities I hadn't considered. Like maybe, just maybe, there's a complex geometric structure when we look at the green versus red. Not exactly a Sierpinski triangle. I just put that there because it looks cool. But it, uh, something that gives a misleading impression when you zoom in on the green dots, such that there is actually a nice chunk of green, but the ones we've uh, zoomed in on, those are just ones that are surrounded by red. Okay. So now, oh yeah, before I move on, he also um, brought up a lot of other points that we can get into at the end, but um, this is the main stuff. Uh, he doesn't think that there would be a lot of green on theism, and he thinks there's possibly quite a lot of green on naturalism. Excuse me. And that, that is what the argument is, is asking us to consider, the proportion of green from theism to naturalism. So time for responses. Uh-oh. I had a cool explosion there, but I, I guess I didn't upload. It was, that, that's annoying. It was like a big fiery explosion, mushroom cloud. Ah, eh, never mind. Did you see it on your end? No, I just see like in like a little like parentheses, cool explosion. Okay, so there's nothing. Every, everybody who's watching, please imagine a cool explosion right there. Okay, anyways, moving on. <laughs> Basically, when I was giving my original argument, like, relationships are good so god we want relationships so that's why god would make a fine-tuned universe i kind of had this gut feeling that like no matter what starting point i started with to try in my chain of reasoning to justify theism the fact that theism implies the existence of a fine-tuned universe like uh, james fedora or, or whatever atheist who's responding would say well you need to justify your starting point and this isn't like um a point against them it's just like i what I'm trying to get at is like, I don't know what would make them happy. What would be a good starting point that would satisfy them? And mm -hmm. so what I basically did is I just like, okay, I'm just going to start with this, uh, that relationships are a good thing that God would want. And knowing that they'll probably object to it, but I mean, I don't know how to please them. So I don't know how to make them happy. So what can you do? But um, I, I think I've, I have something better than just <laughs> choosing an intuitive starting point now. I have an actual argument that is going to be my starting point for my chain of reasoning that leads to theism implies the existence of a fine-tuned universe. So what ar uh, argument is my starting point? Here it is, premise one, axiological intuitions are reliable. Premise two, if axiological intuitions are reliable, then if God exists, he would give us reliable axiological intuitions. Premise three, God exists. Conclusion, therefore our axiological intuitions are reliable. This is gonna be my starting point. So uh, this, what, what can be said about this argument? Well, first, I guess we need to uh, talk about what axiological intuitions are. Um, axiological intuitions are just our intuitions about good stuff, like um, moral goodness or uh, aesthetic goodness or epistemological goodness. Look, just intuitions about good stuff in general. This is a catch-all term for them. And what do I mean by reliable? Well, I don't mean like they're infallible. I, they, pro they definitely can go wrong. But they're just not, they're not totally off course. Like you might think about memory. You can misremember things and your memory isn't infallible, but it's not like the entire life you remember is completely a lie. No, it, it's reliable, basically. Um, so now, uh, objections to this argument. Um, well, one very obvious objection is that the first premise and the conclusion are the exact same proposition, which means that this is a circular argument, which I would, to which I would respond, yes, it is a circular argument, but that's okay because you can use circular arguments when justifying the reliability of your cognitive faculties. Um, or at least you have to. So for example, your memory. Uh, how, how can you prove that your memory is reliable? You, know, you could say, I took a memory test, which shows that my memory is actually quite good. But you have to like rely on your memory to re remember that you actually did take such a test. So the only way to uh, justify the reliability of your memory is by assuming the reliability of your memory. No, there is a nuance that like some philosophers think you don't you can't use the proposition that your memory is reliable to argue for the proposition that your memory is reliable you just like rely on the reliability of your memory not the proposition and so like it's a different kind of circularity and i think you can like take my argument and um make the same sort of uh change to it and it would still work but like that's getting deep into the weeds basically i'm saying i have another um, circular argument for a cognitive faculty. 
uh, our axiological intuitions represent a, um, a cognitive faculty in us um, that is circularly self-justifies. And another um, example of a um, of cognitive faculty that you might need to justify circularly is your ability to make logical inferences. Uh, how can you uh, show that you can make logical inferences? Well, you're gonna whenever you give me an argument that you can make logical inferences, you're going to be using logical inferences. So there's going to be some circularity there. And like I'm gonna say like this is controversial in epistemology, but everything's controversial in epistemology. I think that this is pretty unavoidable. Mm -hmm. Okay, moving on. So premise one is actually pretty solid because it circularly self-justifies. If the rest of the argument's fine, then premise one's fine. So let's move on to premise two. If axiological intuitions are reliable, then if God exists, you would give us reliable axiological intuitions. What's this one saying? Well, it's basically a uh, empirical claim about the intuitions people have. It's saying that people have this sort of intuition that a perfect being like God would want people to have reliable axiological intuitions. And um, you know, there are a couple ways you can motivate this, like saying that, you know, knowledge of what's good is itself good. And a perfect being would promote good things. So a perfect being would promote um, knowledge of uh, what is good. And you, he, he would do that by, you know, reliable axiological intuitions. Another way of thinking about it is like a person who doesn't teach people about the nature of what is good, like um, maybe a father who doesn't tell their kid how to live a good life. They're not as good as a person who does teach uh, people about the nature of what is good, like a father who does tell his kid how to live a good life. And I think this is a really widespread intuition, like um, great thinkers, wise men throughout history have been revered for like their ability to tell people about what's good. So I'm not like, I don't think this is a... Um, like there, there is this big thing in uh, philosophy that uh, some intuitions are like shared only by philosophers. I don't think this is one of them. I think this is a widespread intuition. So then if we like just jack this up to like a perfect being, we're almost certain that he would want people to understand the nature of goodness. So that that seems intuitive, right? I'm actually asking you to sit here and think, is this intuitive that a perfect God would want people to understand how goodness works? If so, then my empirical claim for premise two is true. If axiological intuitions are reliable, then if God exists, he would give us reliable axiological intuitions. Now, premise three, God exists. Well, that seems circular as well. Like, this is my starting point for a premise of a fine-tuning argument that is supposed to establish the existence of God, and I'm using God's existence as a premise? Like, this is totally circular, right? Well, not so fast. What I'm saying is that this argument, it's... Um, it can be used in the probability space of theism. It works in this probability space because that's a probability space where God exists. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't, or sorry, maybe your axiological intuitions are reliable, maybe they're not reliable in the naturalism probability space, but in the theistic probability space, they are reliable and tr report true things at least most of the time. What this means is that when I uh, have the axiological intuition that X is good, that means that it is probably good, unless I find some undercutting defeat or like everybody disagrees with me or something like that. Um, then that means that if it is actually good, then that's something that God would want because God's a good being. And so then theism predicts that we should probably find X. So this is how theism makes predictions. So now I could actually justify my starting point earlier. Um, relationships are good. That's an axiological intuition I have and I think it's fairly widespread. So theism predicts that we would find relationships. Yay, um, prediction. So this is why this is a pretty cool starting point because it self justifies. It's like, you can't ask me why, uh, how to justify my starting point, it self justifies. And this is a really important kind of argument because both um, James Fedor and Nathan Ormond, they make a big deal about like how they think that theism can't predict anything. And like, I've just laid out a framework for how you could say that, yes, theism does predict things. So like, I mean, I'm really interested if, if they have anything to say on this, what they have to say. Um, another point uh, was, right, uh, you brought up, Zach, when uh, you first watched the video, like if, if um, James Fedor blocks like so many inferences about God's psychology, we might not be able to actually run arguments like the problem of evil or divine hiddenness. And like, mm -hmm. I, we should actually be able to run those. I think that those are actually like problems that theists should wrestle with. And uh, I think that this explains, like if my argument is here, 
here is true, that explains why we need to wrestle with it. Because we have these axiological intuitions about evil and hiddenness and so on and so forth that um, make predictions that are not satisfied by theism. So I think like that, that might be some sort of evidence that my argument is actually right, <laughs> that this is a good starting mm -hmm. point. Yeah. So, um, moving on, I can now start to use this cornerstone, this argument to start saying why we would expect a physical universe. Uh, physical universes have uh, all sorts of properties that my axiological intuitions tell me are good. Like they uh, represent a public forum for relationships. Also, this physical universe is really beautiful. Insert clip of Luke Barnes showing us pictures of space. Ooh. And also uh, science. Um, basically, uh, science is, I, th I think that's pretty, it's pretty intuitive that science is a good thing. Uh, you could also say it's like has some pragmatic benefits and also it is beautiful if to live in a universe where science is possible i'll say more about science later uh so moving on um james fedora seems to be think seems to think that i'm saying that um these good things like relationships can only be brought about if we have a fine-tuned universe and he's going to rightly point out that this is a ridiculous statement so what i'm in I wanted to clarify what I'm instead saying. We have like this kind of spectrum here. Like we could say theism entails the existence of a fine-tuned universe, or it somewhat implies a fine-tuned universe, or it is somewhat surprising that we get a fine-tuned universe, or it implies that there is no fine-tuned universe. We have this kind of spectrum. Now I am per I personally have like specific intuitions such that I find that theism strongly implies the existence of a fine-tuned universe, but I'm not gonna argue for that. I'm just going to argue that theism, on theism, it is not surprising that we would find a fine-tuned universe, given all the axiological benefits that it has. Uh, again, I don't need to like, I don't need to show that theism entails the existence of a fine-tuned universe. I don't need to show that you need one. I just need to beat out naturalism. And I think naturalism is more like down here. It's very surprising, given yeah, naturalism, that you'd find a fine-tuned universe. Maybe a kind of intuitive way to put this is that. Uh, if you woke up one day in a fine-tuned universe, given theism, or like you conditionalize some theism, you would say, oh, okay, there's a universe here. I might not have like predicted that. Like if my, uh, my credence, a priori credence might've been less than 50% that we would see this fine-tuned universe. But you know, it makes sense. I could see why God would make this fine-tuned universe. Um, but on naturalism, I think you'd wake up and say like, what, a fine-tuned universe? How'd this get here? Some, something like that. Mm -hmm. So now um, we can take a look at the um, the uh, questions that James Fedora posed earlier. Why would God create anything? Uh, why would God create relationships and so on? I, I, I now actually have the tools to answer this. I could say, why would God create anything? Well, good beings like God promote good things. A being who promotes good things is better than a being who does not promote good things. So God would promote good things and create them. Why would God create relationships in particular? Well, relationships are good. Why would they be in a physical universe? Well, public forums help relationships. Uh, or sorry, yeah, yeah, they uh, give a public forum for relationships to exist, and also uh, physical universes have other axiological benefits like beauty and stuff. And why would they be in a fine-tuned universe? Well, science is a good thing, and a fine uh, you can only have science in a fine-tuned universe. I don't have a slide for this, but I'm going to quickly go into that claim a little bit more. If I'm right about the naturalistic probability space where it's a sea of red with green dots in it, that means that to have a law-like universe that, uh, sorry, a universe that follows laws um, that uh, can support life, that means that if you want a universe like that uh, with all these regularities, it needs, it will be fine-tuned. Like that's uh, all universes with, um, that have a lot like regularities are going to be surrounded by um, universes that cannot support life, if they can support life. And so that means if God wants a universe that has these law like regularities, um, that is a universe wherein you can do science, that means that he's going to have to choose a fine tuned universe. So that's why like, uh, if God wants the benefit of science or like a, a universe that has really nice elegant laws, it's probably going to be fine tuned. Was that, was, did that come out clearly? Yeah, I think it's coming out pretty clearly. I think the one thing I would wonder with regards to what you're saying squared is, um, so with the example, like, do you think, like, God could create a physical universe and you just have, like, maybe peoples 
um, who can interact and like not need a fine tuned universe? Like, so do you yeah, think a fine think, necessary is universe is necessary yeah. for people? Yeah, uh, I don't think um, uh, you need a fine tuned universe for persons to interact, but for like um, them to interact in like a universe that's law like uh, or that operates under a single set of laws down to like its uh, most fundamental particles, uh, that would need to be fine tuned. Okay, so we could have like a physical universe, um, and people are just kind of like interacting, but like the laws of the like that govern the universe would be a little crazy, um, and not like orderly or anything like that. Anything like friendly to science, so we, science. So we need like a fine tuned universe to really get science going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like you could have a physical universe where the laws are aren't very elegant. Like uh, uh, Fedora brought up the example of like a video game kind of universe where we're all in, uh, that everybody's inside and. Um, that, that's a way you could have relationships. I think you could, but I don't think, like, I think God could make a universe that looks like that, but I don't think it would have elegant laws that kind of describe all of reality the same way. Okay, yeah, I think we're on the same page then. Yeah, I think that's great. Yeah, and so basically all this stuff, all my answers to Fedora's questions, they rely on axiological intuitions. And so that's why the cornerstone that I started with, like, my argument about axiological intuitions are so important because, or why that's so important, it allows me to answer all these questions. Okay. Now, where this leaves me is that I basically have all these reasons for expecting a fine-tuned universe under theism. And I don't have any reasons to not expect a fine-tuned universe. Fedora tries to give some, I don't think they work, but setting that aside. Basically, the only reason why it isn't a entailment of theism, like, is that there are other ways God could have done stuff. And like, I, I can't just rule them out. So it's not surprising because I could totally see why God would do it. It's just that there's this nebulous cloud of other alternatives that stop it from being an entailment. Okay, so that's why I think it's not surprising. Um, but, what, but what James Fedora is gonna wanna do is move up naturalism from it's being very surprising that it brings out about a fine-tuned universe is he's gonna bring it up to not surprising. Um, by, again, invoking this idea that maybe the geometric structure of the probability space of life or life permitting versus life prohibiting universes has this kind of structure such that you can zoom in on stuff and it will give you a misleading look at uh, what the green dots have surrounding them. Uh, whereas I'm just going to say it's a sea of red with green dots in it. Now, James Fedor, he says, you may think this is ad hoc, but... I don't think so. And that, I think that's a verbatim quote, but I'm, I can't remember if I actually like quoted him verbatim for that. Now, my response to James Fedor here, it's very, very um, clever and creative. It's, well, you might think it's not ad hoc, but I think it is. So there. Um, uh, I, I could try and like, uh, um, maybe like flesh that out a bit more. So here, here's a story. When, when, I, I'll never forget the my one time my grandfather told me, uh, squared, if it walks like a duck and it talks like a duck, it could be a super complex non-duck-like fractaloid structure embedded in a duck-like hypervolume. And I told my, my grandfather, I have no idea what you're talking about. Okay, jokes aside. That was too many jokes. <laughs> jokes aside. Basically, if we have um, this sort of uh, Prince, or we have this evidence that every X we observe has property Y. Uh, you can make the inference from that that every X does, in fact, have property Y. Those are different statements. Every X we observe has property Y to every X has property Y. Or, or you could say that there are tons of Xs without property Y that we just can't see. And like you can make the second inference if you want, but it seems that the first inference is a better inference. Like, um, so then I'm going to just say that, hey, the inference I'm making is that every life-supporting universe in the epistemic probability space that we've seen has the property that it requires fine-tuning. So it seems like the most natural inference is that that is just a, a part of the nature of life-supporting universes in the epistemic probability space. And Fedora seems to be making a more ad hoc, more complex um, inference than I am. So that's a reason why you should go with my view of the epistemic probability space rather than Fedora's. And like, you know, these induction, um, this the sort of induction, the sort of inference that I'm making, it can fail sometimes, or quite often if you try to overextend it. So maybe I should try and um, 
motivate it some other way. So here's another way you can motivate it. I'm glad these images did load because otherwise <laughs> it wouldn't make any sense. Um, so you might think of a, uh, a, a carbon atom or Conway's in Conway's Game of Life, the glider. These essentially represent the building blocks of life in their, the uh, respective epistemically possible universes. And uh, th they compose all the li living stuff. Okay, that, that's a bit of an oversimplification, but, um, um, you know, you know oversimplifications for explaining. So here's my kind of story for why the probability of space looks like a sea of red with just a couple of green dots. So for a carbon atom, all the particles uh, act on each other with both attractive and repel repelling forces. And it's only when these attractive and repelling forces cancel each other out in a very specific way do we get carbon atoms. And not only that, it's when they... Uh, cancel each other out in a way such that carbon at multiple carbon atoms can exist in a stable form and interact with each other in interesting ways. So that that's why the probability space around um, our universe is all red because one of the uh, either the attractive or the repulsive forces uh, wins out and just destroys the possibility of these interesting interactions. Uh, similarly with Conway's game of life, basically you can um, build into the universe, uh, the, the Conway Game of Life universe, things that promote the existence of dark squares and things that promote the non-existence of dark squares, uh, population growth and population shrinkage of the squares. And it's only when these uh, factors are balance each other out in the right way that you get these stable gliders that can continue to exist throughout time and also interact with each other in interesting ways. If you vary the parameters and the population growth takes over and or the population shrinkage takes over, and that's why um, we get a single green dot surrounded by a sea of red. It's basically, we have these Goldilocks scenarios where all these factors have to um, uh, cancel each other out in just the right way. So that's the kind of story for why the naturalistic probability space looks the way it does. Now, that's I don't know what sort of story that Fedor could give for why the, natu uh, the naturalistic probability space has this sort of complex geometric structure of life supporting versus life prohibiting like dots. And um, maybe he answers this in his book, Reasonable Fa Unreasonable Faith. He, uh, he mentions it quite a bit when he's, give when he's talking about this. And it, um, so maybe he has a sort of story in there, but I don't see it. So I still think that a better inference to draw is that what you have is green dots in a sea of red. That's that's where I'm at. So that uh, that goes that goes over like my response to the main parts, main points why I think there is a decent amount of green on the theism side and not a decent amount of green on the naturalism side. Now I'm just going to go into other comments that Fedor has made um, throughout his vi video. Uh, first, um, the stalking horse hypothesis. Uh, raised by Alex Malpass. I responded to it, and I, I, I didn't understand it. That's why I have this little square guy up here saying, oh, my bad, because I, I, I actually misunderstood the point of it. He's What Fedora says is that like it's supposed to mirror theism in that we uh, whatever reason you ha can give to reject the stalking horse, you could give to reject theism as an explanation. Now, now that I understand that, it's like, oh, okay, so you're just looking for a symmetry breaker between the stalking horse and um, the explanation that God finds in the universe. Well, here's one, my, the argument. Yeah, I'm going back to this a lot, aren't I? Um, basically, uh, we have this argument here about how God, what, what we would expect God to do. So like other conceptions of God where God really likes carbon atoms, God really likes, I don't know, squirrels, all these other kinds of gods, they take up less of, these rival conceptions of God take up less of the high probability space and the conception of God where he likes relationships and where he likes beauty and where he likes um i don't know knowledge all these kind this kind of god takes up more of the probability space now the naturalistic uh stalking horse it seems to take up as much probability space as a um a predisposition towards uh like any anything like a predisposition towards having a gravitational constant that is 10 times its current value or um predisposition towards 12 times its current value or stuff like that. So you, we have the symmetry breaker and I could say why theism is better than the naturalistic stalking horse. Uh, James Fedor brings up the pop, like all these different hypotheses um, that 
God, or different ways God could have made the universe. Like he brings up the idea that God could have just simulated the universe in his mind or that he could have just dreamt up the entire universe. Like some Eastern religions have stuff like that. He didn't have to actually make a physical universe. So the, um, because God um, has all these other options, it shrinks the, 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 the amount of green in the theism probability space. Now in response to this, I'm going to say that the simulation, that God could make a simulation of a fine-tuned universe, or he could, he could have a dream of a fine-tuned universe, but doesn't actually affect the probability space at all. To put it another way, if I learned that, it seems totally possible that I could get to heaven and learn, like God tells me, actually, yeah, the entire physical universe was just a dream uh, that I was having. Like God could tell me that. And then I, what I would say is like, oh, what I thought physical meant is very different. When I thought was saying that electrons are physical, um, I still think they are physical. I just learned that what it means to be a physical object is a lot different. It means to be a part of God's dream or a part of uh, the simulated universe in God's mind. So like, I don't think these count as non-green. If um, God could create a simulation of a fine-tuned universe and that would count as a green dot because all, all of our exper experiential and empirical data would be exactly the same. Now, the things that I think are actually like alternatives that kind of cloud up the theistic probability space, and I think it's th this is a good point from James, is uh, non-spatial slash temporal relationships, such as those that exist within the Godhead. Those I think God could bring those about, and those kind of cloud up the um, the pro theistic probability space. I don't know how God could get like I say beauty in those. Like it's really hard to get beauty without spatial um, relationships. It seems like. You can, you can have some, like, you know, God's beauty and, I guess, the beauty of certain mathematical theorems. But a lot of the beauty in our everyday experience kind of seems to rely on, like, spatial stuff or uh, temporal stuff like music. Um, and also, uh, one we kind of went over already is, like, non-law-like -like, non -like spatial slash temporal universes. And I had to shrink the font of universes because I ran out of space. Um, <laughs> like, uh, a, uh, a universe where there isn't, like, some sort of unifying law that kind of um describes everything it's just kind of more like um a video game where you just program just the bare minimum for a forum for relationships and there isn't any sort of elegance to the underlying public forum i don't know how clear i was with explaining that hopefully you get the picture of what i'm trying to paint yeah i think i'm tracking with you one of the things i took away as i was listening to you there is this idea of especially with regards to like beauty and like understanding the world like, does it need for, like some sort of like geometric structure of the universe is going to be super important um in, like a world it seems like that we need to like like get touched and experience might be super important in trying to understand like the world of beauty and things like that so does, is that tracking with what you're trying to say with regards yeah, to simulations I mean, and dreams I, I, yeah i think you obviously like god's beautiful so like you don't need um to exist in space to have beauty but i mean it really helps i mean like think of think of something beautiful you're probably thinking of something that has spatial location like a beach or the night sky or something like that um or music that requires like temporal uh that like requires time so that you could get like different experiences at different points in time so like it seems to um impinge on god's um like ability to bring about certain kinds of beauty without these kind of spatial temporal um, things. I mean, again, God could, I think that doesn't cut it off as an option, but I mean, I, I'm not surprised that we do live in a, a spatial, temporal, like fine-tuned universe. Um, one thing I'm also going to just throw out there is the idea of projects. Like uh, video games, they tend to um, have like two modes, like kind of a creative mode where you just have unlimited resources and then a, like a survival mode where there are like fixed rules and you have to work for all your resources and if you had a universe where like there what um where there wasn't real rules and you could just do whatever you want uh it would be more like the creative mode in these video games and the thing is like people still include the survival mode in these video games like the video game developers because it seems like you know uh people enjoy that more and i think the reason is like it actually leads to more fulfilling kind of um life if you actually are working towards a project if we had a kind of public forum where people couldn't actually uh or like we it, it, there weren't any like laws um like hard and fast laws it was just you could do whatever you want then um you uh 
you couldn't really uh, engage in projects in the same way as a universe wherein there are um, uh, these co sort of hard and fast physical rules that, you know, God does, he does violate them. I do believe in miracles, but very rarely. And I mean, I, what I'm expecting James to say is that this is like a very superficial uh, reason. And I, I, I had to say, yeah, it is somewhat, super, it, is, um, it is a very weak reason that I'm uh, giving, but it's, it's still one chip in favor of a fine-tuned universe that there isn't on the non-fine-tuned universe side. So I'm not surprised, again, that's all I'm trying to argue for, that I'm not surprised that there is a fine-tuned universe. Okay, next one. Um, angels are, are are physical. Like This is a point that I said that um, James basic, says that basically that undermines my entire fine-tuning argument. And I have the little, oh my bad, square guy up here again, because I actually misunderstood something in uh, the nine hour presentation. Basically, we could define two kinds of physical. Something is narrowly physical. If it had, if it obeys our physical laws, it just has different contents. Like that you could think of epistemically possible universes that still obey our laws, just different gravitational constant or whatever. Um, then we can think of a broadly physical universe. And this just has completely different laws. Maybe gravity isn't even a thing in this universe. Instead, there's a sort of a completely different thing. Um, so with these definitions, we could say like Conway's game of life, that would be broadly physical because it does obey physical laws. It's just not narrowly physical because those laws are totally different. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, I think I'm tracking with you, and it's a helpful distinction to think about the idea. It's like you have narrowly physical, um, looking at like different, like maybe different constants, but similar laws versus broadly physical, which have different laws. Yeah. Um, so I think I'm tracking. So would you say like angels, like they live in like a broadly physical kind yeah, of state? Yeah. Like, like, how do you think angels are living? Yeah, I don't think angels are narrowly physical. I'm, I'm very skeptical that you could get other life in our with our laws and uh, with different constants. Uh, so I, when I was saying that angels are physical, I was saying that they were broadly physical. I thought that um, because James introduced the idea of Conway's game of life, I thought he meant like when he was talking about the naturalistic probability space, I thought he was including like every point represented a bro different broadly physical world in the entire naturalistic probability space. But what he meant, if I'm interpreting him correctly now, is that each point represented a narrowly physical world. So... Conway's uh, games. Conway's game of life doesn't act isn't actually even a point in the naturalistic probability space, and um, this point about angels was just like, well, I'll get to that. Uh, but, so I think that you should. If I was James, I'm actually unsure why he's limiting it to his, the discussion to narrowly physical worlds, because um, it seems that you could make a. Um, it weakens the induction from every green point surrounding with red surrounding it. Therefore, a whole, or sorry, every green point has red surrounding it. Therefore, there's a sea of red with the green points in it. This kind of induction is weakened because we've searched out way less of the uh, broadly physical, prob epistemically probable space than the narrowly physical, epistemically probable space. Am I, am I too many syllables in these words? I need to figure out like abbreviations or something. Anyways, <laughs> um, I still think the this kind of inductive inference still holds because of the, I think the story I gave earlier about Goldilocks is true. Um, but yeah, it, it does weaken this sort of inductive inference I can make. Um, now, but if we, you do talk about uh, broadly physical laws, that, or sorry, not broadly physical, it's broadly physical universes, then I'm going to say that every green point in the naturalistic probability space, that's going to be some physical uh, broadly physical universe wherein life can exist. And I think that gets duplicated into the theistic probability space as well. Because if Conway's game of life is something that can exist in the naturalistic probability space, I think it exists in the theistic probability space as well, that God could say, make an angel in Conway's game of life. But then um, the, uh, so it's going to be in both. The, any green dot in the naturalism is going to be a green blob in theism. It's just that the red doesn't transfer over as well because god i don't see any axiological reason or like benefits to these red dots maybe like they're excuse me they're beautiful in some sense i don't know like there are versions of conway's game of life where you don't get life or anything but it is pretty so maybe that's a reason i don't know that seems pretty weak so i wouldn't really expect god to make that or if he did he wouldn't make that exclusively but yeah so um that, that's what i that's what i have to say about that moving on 
Um, oh, right. Probability, I, I point out that I'm fine with saying that the probability of God creating a universe would be zero because it's still possible for him to create the universe. And um, James asked the question, well, okay, that kind of misses my point. Like my, my question here is, would God be free if that was the case? So you can, um, what I take James to be doing is offering a sort of principle. If there's a 0% chance that an agent will do A, then it is impossible that the agent can freely do A. Uh, if he's not like offering this sort of principle, I don't really understand his objection, but I'm going to give a counter to this principle. And <laughs> sorry, I just noticed at the bottom right, I, I wrote, I have a video on this. And in the presentation I'm, I made, I put a little square over the question mark because I realized it's not a question. I do have a video on this, <laughs> but uh, apparently that little square didn't <laughs> carry over, but yeah. Anyways, um, here's a thought experiment. Uh, God wants to choose a random number between three and four, and every number is equally possible or is equally likely. And that seems totally possible to me. Like God could do uh, think of a random number if he wanted to. And if that was the case, then what's the probability that God would choose exactly pi? Like exactly pi, not just close to pi, exactly that one number out of infinity numbers. And mathematicians. Um, there's some discussions about infinitesimals and all that, but the best answer seems to be that the probability is zero. So, so for any given number, the probability is zero. So then it seems that like God in this thought experiment, God could freely choose any value. Uh, but it, if every, every possible option has a probability of zero for him to choose that specific value, well, then, uh, there are things that God can freely choose with a probability of zero. So like, I don't think this principle is true. And I could give like more of a story about what happens with God. Maybe like he recognizes the good of infinitely different possible worlds. And there's like um, a 1% chance in each case that he would pass up the goods of those uh, possible worlds. So then him passing up all the goods of every possible world has a zero chance of happening, but he still freely could do it, something like that. Okay, um, now does God need relationships? So basically the idea is God isn't supposed to be needy. He doesn't have any needs. He's totally satisfied in himself. So um, what James Fedora asks is it's like, okay, you're saying God will create these, um, create a universe for relationships. Well, doesn't that mean he needs a relationship? And I, I take him to be offering yet another principle. The principle is if an agent acts rationally, then they are, they are acting to fill, fulfill some sort of psychological need that they have. And I have no idea why the word have didn't appear here that, that's weird. Every, every other word appeared here. Um, so this principle, I think, is very dubious in the case of humans. Again, if this isn't the principle that James is trying to offer, I don't know what he what his objection is. Uh, but again, I might be misunderstanding what he's saying. So um, principle is that if an agent acts rationally, then they are acting to fulfill some sort of psychological need that they have. So I want you to imagine another thought experiment. You're sitting in a hot tub, okay? And you're just completely satisfied. Oh, what'd you do? Zach, you moved my slides. Yeah, I know. I was looking at the slide number and I accidentally switched the slide. So my apologies. <laughs> okay. So you're in the hot tub completely. You have all your needs fulfilled. And you could say effortlessly move your finger. And if you did so, it would create another universe full of other people all living such a happy universe as you. And um, could you do that in this case rationally? I mean, it, to me, it seems like, yeah, totally you could. Even though all your needs are fulfilled, you could like recognize like, th that that would still be a good thing to do. And based off of that recognition, even if you don't need to do it, you could still do it. So that that's um, so this is a shaky principle when it comes to humans, it seems. However, um, then James wants to apply this to God. And I don't like the psychological principle. And I don't I think that's even more shaky because like maybe for God, what seems to be more plausible to me is that if God recognizes uh, something as good, that acts as a motivation to bring about the, the good rather than a need for that good. So I don't think that um, this is a very good objection. But anyways, moving on. Uh, oh, is the Trinity three minds? Um, like that, I, I said relationships need minds in a... Um, and at one of my parts, so that's why God would create minds and why we have minds and all that fun stuff. And uh, James Fedora points out that God has relationships, so is God three minds? And I actually, I do think so. I think he has three centers of consciousness. I, I think that's enough to count for a mind. I'm called a social Trinitarian because I believe that. There are um, 
other people who are not social Trinitarians, like classical theists. But I mean, come on, Zach, we know that classical theism is weird. And um, we did cover that in part one. So yes, uh, but even if you don't uh, agree with uh, me there, um, you you could also just run the same argument with persons. Relationships need persons, so that's why there are persons in the world. I think that that would still work. Uh, I also have a little bit of an anecdotal story, and we're going a lot quicker than I thought we were going to go. So I, I'm, I'm going to take some time to tell this story. Uh, one time, I'm, I once met a lady from Japan, and she was interested in learning what Christians believed. Uh, she didn't have like a um, very deep understanding of their doctrine, so she um, asked me what Christians believe, and I uh, started going through the doctrines. And like, um, yeah, we we believe in. Uh, uh, heaven, hell, and there's this guy who's Jesus. He died for our sins. He's also fully God and fully human. And um, then I go to start thought about the Trinity, and she was she wasn't completely fluent in English. Like she was, she uh, could have a pr pretty good conversation, but not like 100% fluent. So I'm like thinking, like, okay, how am I going to explain the Trinity through a language barrier? <laughs> and um, this was a couple of years ago. And the explanation I settled on was, um, so God has three minds and one soul. So like, uh, if this is a heresy that God has three minds, uh, somebody better let me know. Cause not only am I spreading this heresy, I'm spreading it, it across the world, apparently. <laughs> um, anyways, moving on. Uh, oh yes. Um, James Fedor also argued that like, it's actually surprising that we don't have disembodied um, minds because disembodied minds would actually be better for relationships because they could just telepathically like have direct awareness of the minds of each other and the fact that we don't have that means that like um or sorry that that rate lowers the probability uh, that we would have a fine-tuned universe now i think that you can actually run an argument against these in here and be like oh we would expect to have um more direct awareness of each other um, but I don't think this has anything to do with fine tuning because you could have like physical telepaths. Like he mentioned, uh, James Fedora himself mentioned Star Trek and, um, Star Trek, like there were these alien races that could communicate with each other telepathically and have like direct awareness of each other's minds. And, uh, there's also that avatar movie with all the, the big blue guys. And they had like, um, these ponytails with uh, all these kind of nerve stuff in them that they could connect to each other and like telepathically interact with other minds that way. Uh, that, that's if you've seen the movie, you know what I mean. <laughs> but like, yeah, they're all the. It seems that like it's totally possible to have physical telepaths, even like in our fine-tuned universe. And you could also have disembodied telepaths, like Fedora went over that. But I think you could also, or yeah, and we are in the bottom left corner. We're physical, boring people who only have indirect access to each other. But I also think you could have disembodied, boring people with only indirect access to each other. But by boring people, there I mean just like. Uh, the, the relationships are less than direct access with another person's mind. So think of um, disembodied minds that all know Morse code, and the, the, the only telepathic messages that they can send to each other are um, like dots and dashes. So that, that's how they could communicate. There you still have relationships, but it's uh, disembodied minds and um, not uh, it's not direct awareness of the other minds. So what I'm trying to show here is that uh, this sort of direct awareness of another mind is completely independent of being physical or disembodied, so it doesn't have any bearing on the fine-tuning argument. It still leaves the question open, why don't we have direct awareness of one another's minds? And I think that the standard answer will just probably be whatever you give as your favorite theodicy. But um, another thing that I thought of that you might give is like, well, if you have significantly free creatures with the ability to sin, and uh, they do sin, well, then it might actually hurt relationships if you have direct awareness of this other sinful creature's sinful mind. Like, that might actually be, like, uh, detrimental to relationships. Like, if um, if somebody is a jerk, would being able to know their mind directly and fully uh, help you, or would it hinder you? It's, maybe it would help you, but I, I don't think that, that you can assume that without argument. Anyways. Uh, oh, and Lafin. Apparently, uh, this was supposed to say Lafin. There's no fin. <laughs> yeah, all the formatting of this PowerPoint is messed up. Anyways, <laughs> that, uh, that's everything I have to say. So, um, yeah, thank you once again, James, uh, for your response. And uh, hopefully we'll one day have a response to this. That is your response to this response to your response to our response to you responding to fine-tuning apologists. There we go. <laughs> 
we the, i'm gonna move the slide we our goal is just to have this really really crazy weird long like slide yes wait, i want a here. screen grab of you on the side looking at this section of the video here <laughs> Also wait, wait, here's the problem though. We didn't pull up any of James's stuff, so there's no way to screen grab it. So it would just be like oh, this okay. screen right here. You yeah. actually could do this. I don't know. So <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. So maybe um, then Square might be helpful. Um sorry, I keep interrupting you. Do you want to say something? Nope. Sorry, you you go. I was gonna recap things. So it looked yep. like to me like the two big things um is we're looking at this is one the question of like how like Theism does with like explaining fine tuning. And your big intention contention is like we can say like these and like we'd expect to it because um we have reliable like axiological intuitions like we know things like relationships are good things um so you have good like intuition that god would create like a universe that would allow for things like relationships um so that's going to support like the theistic side yeah. and then countering the atheistic side where well, james will say yep yeah, mm -hmm. and i'm not saying like um this might even be a prediction I, all i'm arguing for is it's not surprising like it might be less than 50 percent probable it might like be less than a 50 50 shot that we would have a fine-tuned universe given theism but it's not like something that it would surprise us if it did happen okay keep mm -hmm. going okay that's what i was gonna say with the theistic side and then on the atheistic side um james was to say there's a bunch of space where we really just have no clue um what's mm -hmm. going on here if there's gonna be a bunch of life maybe there isn't maybe there will be we just don't know so it's hard to make like a probability assessment and your kind of response um is kind of looking at the idea of well if it seems like it's going to be lifeless looking at it, well, there's probably a good chance that it's going to be lifeless. And just saying, like, well, maybe it seems that way. Um, well, we're going to need more than that, more meat than that, because just based off what we know um, and seeming the way things are, like, in our universe, it's going to be a good chance that it's going to just be lifeless um, or very low probabilities for life, like little green dots from here and there, um, everywhere yeah, else that we haven't examined. We're making this sort of inductive inference that um, these fine-tuning – these every fi epistemically possible fine-tuned universe is surrounded by epistemically possible uh, life-prohibiting universes. Or, mm -hmm. Sorry, fine, if I say fine-tuning, that begs the question. Every epistemically possible life-permitting uh, universe is surrounding by, surrounded by epistemically life -pro possible life-prohibiting universes. So I'm, we also have a bit of a story about why that would be the case. So it's not a per we're not, we can't be certain of it, but I think that it's actually not a terrible kind of inference to say that's the way the probability space looks. All these, uh, every epistemically possible life permitting universe has, um, or at least a lot of it has like just is surrounded by red. Okay. Yeah. I think that's great. And I mean, I probably am most on the same page with you and agreeing with what you said. Um, and yeah, anything else you want to like repeat or like, um, bring up before we wrap up here? Um, the only thing I'd like to repeat is that my grandfather once told me that if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's a super complex non-duck-like <laughs> fractaloid structure embedded in a duck-like hypervolume. And everyone starts laughing from now into eternity. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, awesome. thank you so much. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Squared, for coming on. And thank you, James, for making um, the response to this response or to the past response. Um, super grateful for James, his opinion. He's really like great, knowledgeable guy. And we value what he says a lot. And that's why this response was made. So, yeah. Thank you so much. And thank you, Squared, for putting together all this work of putting together all these slides. And I know this won't be the end of what we're doing because hopefully we have fun stuff lined up in yeah. the future. So, yeah. Thank you so much for coming on. This is not the end of the mediocre apologist. So, no, don't worry. <laughs> Episode number three. I have to figure out how to make this thumbnail now. So yeah, awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on, man. I appreciate it so much. And yeah, thank you everyone for listening. If you value this, I encourage you to check out Apologetic Squared. Just added right there in the YouTube. And James says great content should also be added in the YouTube title. And yeah, if you value us, um, subscribe, leave a like, all that fun stuff. And we'll see you next time. So peace out and God bless. We'll see you next time.